This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Um, this evening I have kind of a premiere. I am the very first time myself connected via Skype with a brother in Christ in Pennsylvania, United States of America, by the name of Daryl Eberhardt, whom you of course all know. Not only from my channel, but especially on my channel, I have been starting uploading videos with Daryl in there, interviews I did with Brett and him, and uh, talks he did with uh, Brett alone. All that stuff. Um, Daryl is um, a wonderful brother in Christ and all of a sudden has found the possibility to come to a computer and come to the phone and uh, he made contact again I think also with Tom Fress some, some, some years ago and uh, he made a connection with Brett and via Brett with me and I am very very glad to welcome him today as my guest on this show on Hour of the Truth where we will be talking about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and everything that surrounds that. And there are even today a few things I think uh, a lot of people, even like you, who are watching this video right now, do not know or did not realize. And this came to me by a revelation um, when, I was, when I was listening to Tom Fress's broadcast in 2010 where he read Code Word Babylon. But before I get into the fine tuning of what this broadcast is all about, let me just welcome our brother in Pennsylvania and the United States of America, Daryl Eberhardt. Hello, Daryl. Welcome to the broadcast and thanks for being with me today. Hello, and again, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be on with you or you and or Brad or you and or Michael anytime. And so we're trying to get truth out to folks, and we're doing it in a kind way, firmly, but with tough love, as they say, And because we feel that uh, the times are very dangerous that we live in. As a matter of fact, uh, I stayed up till 6 a.m. my time this morning without going to bed, and I was working on an article about the Great War, World War I, and 
um, how papal Rome had its fingerprints and footprints, Jesuit-controlled papal Rome, I should say, all over that war. So that's one I hope to be getting out to you soon, Yerk, via yeah, an email. World War One is an interesting subject, and uh, I covered that in one of my last uplo latest uploads on The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris. You know that I read that book in completion in German and in English, and I uploaded the complete book reading in German on my channel already, and I am now with uh, part 12 or something of 30 parts altogether in English and uploading that. Yeah, but... Um, and there he also speaks about the First World War from another point of view than, of course, we Germans are mostly taught when we are in school. But anyway, um, I wanted to talk to you today about a subject that has come to me to my attention when I was listening to Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who did a broadcast in uh, the month of September 2010 when he was reading the book Cold World Babylon. A wonderful book by P.D. Stewart. It's a two-parter. Uh, part one is called Cold World Babylon 666, Danger in the Vatican, uh, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. And part two is called Cold World Babylon, uh, The Antichrist is a Woman, Alive and Well. And both uh, books are being distributed by LuxVerbi.org and you can still get them there or on any other place in the internet via eBay, even used. I have a used copy of this, and I, of this, and I read the complete book in, um, uh, with Brett together, and we are still uploading those parts because I think we did about 100 parts, um, and uh, just over 20 are uploaded on Brett's channel and only 20 on my channel because the videos have not been made, but the audio recordings are done. So the point is that I was listening to Tom Fress reading that book in chapter, I think it is chapter 30, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, chapter 30, that deals with Lincoln's assassination, the untold story. And um, he read a part that I'm going to read to you right now, and uh, Daryl is, of course, here and can listen to that too. That's why I read this. I scanned two pages of the book. I don't know if you have that book handy, Daryl, to Cold War uh -huh. Babylon. It's down in my basement oh, on, okay. the, on the same washing machine that I hefted up that 150-pound thing over my head. So, yes, I, that book is right down on my washing machine in my basement. Okay, I don't send you down back to your, um, to your basement right now. I'm just going to read it and you will go and sure. recognize it. You will recognize it anyway. But the, for the viewers of the video, they have the PDF that I just scanned, these two pages now in the, in, in the picture, and they can read along. It says on the bottom of page 302 in Volume 1 of Cold World Babylon, the newspaper of the town of St. Cloud, Minnesota, Monday, April 17, 1865, will furnish us with further proof of the involvement of the Jesuits in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln at the hands of John Wilkes Booth. Positive evidence that these Jesuit fathers, priests of Rome, engaged in correspondence with their brethren in Washington City and had been informed of the plan to assassinate the president, the agents for its accomplishment had been found, the time for its execution had been set, and so sure were they, so sure were they of its accomplishment that they could announce it, the actual assassination itself, as already done three or four hours before it had been consummated. They could not refrain from passing it around as a piece of glorious news. <laughs> the St. Cloud newspaper heard of President Lincoln's assassination because it was reported to them by Francis A. Conwell, chaplain of the 1st Minnesota Regiment. Conwell himself was given news of the... Let's go up of the assassination by an employee, J. H. Linneman, of the Catholic Seminary in St. Joseph, Minnesota, several hours before it had actually taken place. So the Catholic priests at the seminary in Minnesota knew of Lincoln's death, even though they were hundreds of miles away from the place of the assassination, in an era when it took days, if not weeks, for news to get from one place to another. Do you not find that incredible? Now we read from a quote from Charles Chinnicky's book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome, where Chinnicky writes, quote, Three or four hours before Lincoln was murdered in Washington, the 14th of April, 1865, that murder was not only known by someone, but it was circulated and talked of in the streets and in the houses of the priestly and Romish town of St. Joseph, Minnesota, unquote. 
Chiniki continues to say that, quote, the fact is undeniable. The testimonies are unchallengeable. And there were no railroad nor any telegraph communications nearer than 40 or 80 miles from the nearest station to St. Joseph. On the 14th of April, 1865, the priests of Rome knew and circulated the death of Lincoln four hours before its occurrence in their Roman Catholic town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. But they could not circulate it and they could not know it without belonging to the band of conspirators who assassinated President Lincoln. This, reader, is the true story of the assassination of President Lincoln, history you will not find in your American history books. That's quite an interesting point to start with, isn't it, Daryl? Yes, it is, and can I just make a real quick comment, and that is what Yerk is telling you has been verified by a number of different authors of books. Yerk already mentioned Charles Chinnicky, who was very, very close to Abraham Lincoln. Charles Chinnicky has it in his book, and I have two versions of Chuck C.T. Wilcox's book. His first one was called The Transformation of the Republic. I don't know why, but he kept changing the title of the book each time he would do a revision of it. I've got a, a 644-page America's Lost Identity, also by Charles T. Wilcox, and he's got the same story in there that you just related about how the priests in America and that had tipped off some of their buddies uh, up further north uh, be, be about Lincoln being uh, going to be assassinated before it happened. And that's, there is no way, they didn't have Federal Express drop off within five seconds after you take it down to the office. That wasn't available to them. So that these priests clearly knew ahead of time. Go ahead, Jerk. I just wanted to put that in that there were other authors have confirmed this. Unfortunately, you're right. It's not in American history textbooks, not in universities, not in colleges, and not in high schools, and certainly not in secondary elementary schools. No, oh, and I thank you very much for bringing that to our attention about this um, uh, that we have been reading here. And of course, there are many books like uh, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by Burke McCarthy, which I have in the picture right here that you can uh, look it up. But the point that I want to make was when I was listening to Tom Fress reading that book, and shame on me, I read the book myself, but I didn't make that connection that Tom Fress made. Now, the question is, what connection are you talking about, Jörg? Well, I'm going to open the video right here, and we're going to watch this video for 3 minutes and 32 seconds. Daryl has the same video um, at his place because he's connected via the phone. He cannot watch the video here with us. But when I say, let's go, we are, he clicks on it, and he can, look, uh, he can watch it, and uh, he can have his own audio and listen to it, not too loud, I hope, so that there won't be a technical problem with our sound here. But uh, let's go and watch this video that was um, broadcasted on the 11th of September 2001 in the afternoon. And now, let's go. New York have been hit by airplanes. In Washington, there is, there is a large fire at the Pentagon. The Pentagon has been evacuated. And there, as you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. Because everybody, once you have seen Building 7, there is no way back. You can, you can cheat on yourself, and you can try to suppress it, no but, but you cannot. You, you have seen it, and then there is no way back. It's, very, it's not very healthy, you know, to lie to yourself. I say, no, I didn't see that. But some, many people do, because it's simply too painful. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. It seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened. Uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? 
Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that, there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Presumably there were very few people in the Sullivan building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. That's what you would hope, because they don't really know where to turn. Uh, that's the very sad thing. I think there's going to be a lot of very, very traumatized people that, that has hit them very, very hard. Jane, I think many of us, when we heard the news, perhaps on the radio earlier today, were uh, completely flabbergasted by it and, and just couldn't un comprehend it. I mean, it, was, it almost sounded too far-fetched. Um, I was wondering what it's felt like for you being in Manhattan. Well, unfortunately, I think we've lost the line with uh, Jane Stanley in Manhattan. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of the school. Amazing, incredible picture word. Too far fetched. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well placed dynamite to knock it down. See what you see and not what you're supposed to see. Yeah, so that was the video. I'm done here watching. Have you completed watching it, Daryl? Yes, I have, and I got to hear the video. And, I, of course, I've seen most of these things before because Loose Change and other people, they've put out videos, you know, with a lot of questions about what had happened there. And, uh, of course, those those all look to me like controlled demolition things. And, um yeah, there's there's a lot of holes in their story, just like there's a lot of holes in their story about the assassination of JFK. Uh, I just right. got the book. I just got the book in the mail. Uh, JFK, the Dead Witnesses, <laughs> and it's amazing. I've got about thirty-five books on the assassination of JFK, and I didn't have that one. And that one was by Craig Roberts, who I met in person. Craig Roberts was a Marine sniper, and he, I met him at a conference down in West Virginia and uh, talked with him briefly, but uh, he put out a book, uh, A Sniper Looks at Dealey Plaza or whatever, and, of course, with this book that Craig Roberts put out with a guy named Armstrong uh, together, they give you a list of 115 witnesses uh, that had mysterious, suspicious, or very convenient for the powers that be uh, uh, deaths because just before, like, you know, uh, a couple days or a couple hours before they're scheduled to go before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, mm, they turn up dead. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, they, several were clearly murdered, like Sam Giacano that got like about six to eight bullets to his head. They put the gun in his mouth, I think, and fired about six or eight more after he got shot in the back of the head. And Sam Giacono was, of course, the mafioso boss in Chicago, and he was involved with the CIA and with Central Intelligence Agency with uh, the no doubt the hiring of some of these uh, uh, assassins that were shooters that were used to kill Kennedy. And then you had uh, Johnny Roselli was another guy scheduled to uh, testify before the House Select Committee on his assassinations concerning the JFK assassination, and he he turns up in an oil drum floating off the coast of Miami, I think it was. Uh, and I think he was in pieces. They'd cut him up in pieces to make sure he'd fit into the drum very conveniently. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of holes in the story. But, uh, yeah, I've seen uh, several different videos about the uh, uh, collapse of the buildings, and, and I think that 
the loose change, et cetera, videos, they all very, very much bring out the truth that um, airplanes don't hit buildings and okay, make them me, hot enough that it melts still. Let me just interrupt sure. you there, Daryl. The points you are making are all very valid, and they are all interesting to be spoken upon on a later time in this broadcast. Sure. The point that I want to make right now with you and with our listeners and viewers of this video is, do you get where the similarity is or what the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865 and the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11th, 2001 had in common? And because I'd like to hear that point. one. Yeah, because that's yeah. the point that Tom Fress made, and that's what kicked me off my shoes. The guard of uh, the hand of God was involved, because in 1865 we have had the publication of the murder of Abraham Lincoln already hours before it happened in a newspaper. Oh yeah. And we had 20 minutes before the demolition of World Trade Center 7, the reporting that it fell down in this BBC video. That is the hand of God intervening, telling us they are screwing with you. They are lying to you. And here is proof and nobody can deny it. And every big television station all over the world showed it live and later on. That World Trade Center Building 7 was demolished not because of a terrorist attack, but because of other causes that are not even spoken about, and I don't even go into that discussion, but the demolition was reported while the building was still standing. Right. And that I call the hand of God, like in 1865, talking about the president is dead and has been assassinated, when that is still three, four hours in the future, is the same thing. But as you rightfully mentioned a, a little bit earlier in the broadcast, of course, the people, and like um, P.D. Stewart also writes in his book, the people in 1865 did not have the media possibilities that we have today. They did not have the communication abilities that we have today. They didn't even have a telegraph 40 miles out of that city where that happened. So news couldn't travel that far. But in 2001, the news of the attack towers traveled all around the world, almost in live broadcasts, all the day. And in the evening, at 5.20, uh, at 520 uh, the Salomon building uh, collapsed. And this is a point that Tom Fress put out in his reading of Cold War Babylon, something that I did not make the connections when I read that book and said, why did I not make the connections? Well, you see, Tom has studied so much more, and he's so much smarter than me in that regard. He saw a connection where I didn't see it, and that's what I wanted to put up today. That's what I wanted to talk to you about um, Daryl, it is not only the assassination of Abraham Lincoln that we can talk about. It is not only um, the uh, uh, terrorist attacks of 2001 that we can talk about. And let me assure you, it, it were terrorist attacks, but the terrorists are not the ones that they present to you. <laughs> 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 that's, that's another game. So I want to talk about this and I want to speak about Daryl. Uh, you know, we did a little prayer before we did this broadcast. I, I no, normally never do that. I never pray openly. I never pray with anybody else. But we did it. You requested it, and I thought it was fine. It was off the record, and we did it. And here we have the proof of the hand of God in even these actions of the Antichrist, where he deceives the whole world. Isn't that a wonderful thing, Daryl, to talk about? Yeah, it sure is, because... These people are very good at what they do. However, they do make mistakes. And, and, and no doubt God has his hand in a, at various times where they think they've gotten away with something and someone picks up on it and gets the information out. And thank God that we've had people like Burke McCarty and um, Brigadier General Thomas M. Harris that they sat down well, Harris got to read all the testimony in that because he, he, he read the, about the civil trials as well as, of course, he was on the military commission that tried eight of the conspirators and hung four of them. But, the, but Burke McCarty, she went back and, thank God we got people that do research, she went back and read every newspaper that she could. And her book didn't get published until 1924. 
But who knows how many hundreds of hours this precious lady researched the Lincoln assassination, and she got a little bit angry about it because you can tell in the book there she got that they thought they got away with killing America's one of America's most beloved presidents, and that the Jesuits pretty much thought that nobody was going to report on their connections and their fingerprints, and as you know, their footprints are all around surrounding the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So yeah, that is great, Yerk. That. Uh, that was pointed out by Tom Fress, and and people need to remember that this isn't the first time. That this has happened before, where they've put something out, and local television or even ABC or NBC, CBS picks up on it, and you get it in the first like hour or something of when the event happens. Pay attention whenever any if you're watching TV, which I try not to, but if you're watching it pay attention to the initial reports that come out because sometimes they slip up even at the major networks like NBC, ABC, CBS. They slip up CNN and one of their people will, sometimes they got a local guy on the ground that's tied into their system and that person will tell you what really happened. And then if you go back the next day trying to find that, unless you recorded it yourself, it's not there anymore because the network whether it's CNN, ABC, any of the big ones, they don't replay it. So, yeah, pay attention. If you're watching something like when uh, you've got a, a real nasty event going on or something, watch the initial reports carefully because sometimes they slip up and leave evidence behind of their own little fingerprints and, and footprints. So, you're, yeah, yeah, that's great that uh, you're pointing this out that uh, – uh, they cut that. Not only did they cut the, the lady off, but uh, uh, I bet you if you went back uh, a few days later and tried to get that picture, uh, you didn't couldn't get it. I'm quite sure that they uh, buried it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you couldn't get that anymore. That's right. And I think it is just very interesting to make this connection. And now, of course, in the future, we will maybe talk about that. Maybe there were also some kind of these glitches that were happening during the John F. Kennedy assassination. But, um, I mean, between Abraham Lincoln and 2001, uh, 156 years in between. Um, so that's uh, 40, 46 years. 146 years in between, that's uh, quite a lot of time. But it, it's just astounding to me that, I mean, this video that I just showed you, um, is a video you just put it in the in the search engine uh, uh, WT7 uh, BBC and mm -hmm. you get it and you get it and you can watch it everywhere in the world that the proof is out there for everybody to see Daryl not yeah. dark, that far away and what do people do they behave like an ostrich Mm -hmm. They just put their head in the sand and said, I don't want to see it. They all want to believe the official conspiracy theory instead of the unofficial conspiracy theory. Because I said earlier, of course that was fomented by terrorists, but terrorists from within and not terrorists from without. I mean, if you are that gullible that you still think, uh, that you still believe that 19 towel-headed camel jockeys flew big planes into buildings and these buildings, as a result of that, became dust. Yeah? They were not only demolished in a way that we know it, uh, or, or they, did even, they didn't even crash like you would expect maybe a house to crash when a plane flies into it, even though that was impossible at that time with a plane to bring down a skyscraper like that to, to tremble. But even if you want to believe that, I mean, this video is in your face. It's like the sun that shines in the day. You go outside on a, on a, on a day where you have blue sky, there's no cloud covering the sky, and the sun is shining, and you go out and you deny the sun is shining. There are so many people out there who just don't want to get it, and I want to talk to these people and say, listen, the proof is here. And the proof does not come from me, Jörg or Daryl or whoever. The proof comes from these television stations themselves. They broadcasted that live. 
and everybody in the world was there to see it. Uh, many people recorded it and these recordings are still available today and you can see it. As of course probably also that newspaper where the death of Abraham Lincoln was published uh, a few hours beforehand still is available. But there of course is not that timeline on. You cannot see that that was published even hours before uh, the facts happened in the time. We just have to understand that the people who do this have an evil agenda. That's because they work for the devil. They even um, sold their soul to the devil to do that. They are the people that are spoken above in the Bible. When the Bible says, And marvel not, for Satan himself is transferred into an angel of light. Therefore it is no wonder that also his ministers are uh, um, uh, transformed into ministers of righteousness. Something like that, the Bible says. Yeah, you're 100% right. Uh, that's the Apostle Paul. Yeah. And these people are sitting in the governments. They are taking oaths to lead you and to guide you and to help you. And in their understanding, they do. But they lead you on the broad way that leads into perdition and not unto the small way that leads to Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. They have another agenda. And you know, the, one of the big points of hypocrisy I always find when there's this inauguration of the American presidents, when they swear this oath of office and they say that I swear to, um, to protect the people of the United States of America from all enemies within and without, And they are the enemy within. They are the cancer that is in every nation, planted by the Roman Catholic Church, because that Antichrist Church, that harlot of Babylon the Great, is the one that has a shadow government in all countries of this world. And that's why in the wonderful book of Revelation, let me just open that up here, I have to get a second to get on Revelation chapter 17, And in Revelation chapter 17, God tells us in very clear words, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So Daryl already told you, don't watch television. And you know that I advocate that already since years. Don't do that. Because when you drink, when you, when you watch television, you are drinking of the wine of the fornication. And it says, uh, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now the kings of the earth are all the kings, like over here in Belgium where I live, we have a king as head of state. Uh, in Netherlands, um, we have a, uh, a king as a king. Uh, as a head of state in Denmark and in and, and, and Spain and in and, and some European countries we have that but in every country where we don't have a king we have a president or we have a prime minister or something like that and those people are the kings that are addressed to here in Revelation chapter 17 verse 2 the kings of the earth because a prime minister when he is the chief of the executive government of a country he is the king he wears another title but he still is the king. And these kings have committed fornication with the inhabitants, uh, with, with, with the whore, means they have um, taken from her poisoned wine, which is a poisoned doctrine, which is another gospel, the one that Paul warned about. Don't accept another gospel, even, even if it comes from an angel. If it is not the same that we preach to you, it is a false one and they all are in bed with the whore of Babylon yeah? and this is not just me saying it it is God himself saying it I'm just explaining it in other words to you and hope that you will understand it and get it and then will take your own conclusions out of that that you will not be betrayed anymore now speaking about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln is an interesting subject and especially uh, speaking about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and how um, it all developed and I know that Daryl is very well studied in that subject 
And if you want to, Daryl, we can go on a little bit about that and tell the people what it was all about. If you want to, we can also tell the people about the whole deception of this quote-unquote civil war, of this war of, de uh, of secession, because it was just a war of deception. It was a war, it was a crusade, actually. Yeah, it was a holy war, um, but not, of course, for the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible doesn't go on holy, war, holy wars. We fight, and he fights with his word, and uh, his sword is his word. Do you want to go a little bit more into the details of the Abraham Lincoln uh, life, uh, politics, and assassination here, Daryl? Sure. But let me say one thing first, and that is Yerk's 100% correct because he's telling you what the Bible says about the kings of the earth, the emperors and queens and that, princes. The Bible uses that word fornication, and what they mean is they're committing spiritual fornication. They're, and Yerk used the good term, they're in bed with the whore. And that's one of the good things that uh, I've picked up also reading in some of these the books, like um, this one that uh, Brett sent to me recently, and it's about Rome's involvement in the Great War in World War I, but it shows how clearly... Uh, that Rome helped foment World War I, and of course, as Jerk knows, that he's read it in both German and English in the secret history of the Jesuits. As a matter of fact, let me give them that quote, because it's so good, and I've got the book right in front of me, and it's not that long of a quote, but it's on page nine. What, what's the title of the book, Daryl? It's the one you've been reading. It's The Secret History of the Jesuits by oh, yeah, Edmund okay. Harris. Okay, that one. Okay, and it's not that long of a quote, but it's it's good because it shows um, how heavily involved. And, and I would urge people if you don't, uh, if you want to read a book uh, showing Rome's responsibility in uh, fomenting, uh, instigating, whatever word you want to use, they they basically orchestrated and choreographed the events that led up. Uh, to that uh, Balkan war, that Balkan peninsula in southeastern Europe. Um, they may make noises like, no, the Pope's ha were, hands were lily white and he was trying to prevent the war. No, the Pope was the one that was telling the Austria-Hungarian, the Roman Catholic Austrian, Ro Roman Catholic Austrian-Hungarian Empire to go after the Orthodox Christian Orthodox Christian country, Serbia, uh, the Pope said, it's time that, uh, that uh, you guys take care of this problem of the Serbs. So they actually were, but let me get into the quote because that's going to cover some of this. Here's what Edmund Paris says in the uh, foreword of his book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, is on page 9. He says, the, pa the public is practically unaware of the overwhelming responsibility carried by the Vatican and its Jesuits in the start of two world wars, a situation which may be explained in part by the gigantic finances at the disposition of the Vatican and its Jesuits, giving them power in so many spheres, especially since the last conflict. In fact, the part they took in those tragic events has hardly been mentioned until the present time. And, of course, he wrote this book uh, you know, after World War II, but uh, he, except by apologists eager to disguise it. It is with the aim of rectifying this and establishing the true facts that we present in this and other books the political activity of the Vatican during the contemporary epoch, activity which mutually concerns the Jesuits, this study is based on irrefutable archive documents, publications from well-known political personalities, diplomats, ambassadors, and eminent writers, most of whom are Catholics, even attested by the imprimatur. These documents bring to light the secret actions of the Vatican and its perfidious actions in creating conflicts between nations when it served its interests, in other words, the papacy, the Vatican's interests, with the help of conclusive articles, we show the part played by the Church, and he means the Roman Catholic Church, in the rise of totalitarian regimes in Europe. Almost done. These testimonies and documents constitute a crushing indictment, and so far, no apologist has tried to disprove them. So, there's a man that did his homework, really researched things, and he says that 
we can lay World War I and World War II at the doorstep of Jesuit-controlled papal Rome. So if you're interested in those subjects, either World War I and or World War II, I would highly suggest that you pick up that book if you want, you're interested in reading, that you buy the book, The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris, and you can get that at chick.com, and that would be the best place to go up and look. Yeah, if you want to buy the book and hold it in your hands, if you say mm-hmm. it is not even necessary to hold it in my hands, you can download the book for free on the Internet and read it as a PDF, as I did when I did the reading on the videos. So you don't even have to spend money on it. It is available for free. And there's a few people like me, Yerk, that I am the type of guy when I go through it, and that's how I, I tr- helped. It helps me to memorize a lot of the dates and the people's names and stuff because I love to go through a book slowly with my yellow highlighter, my different color ink pens, and I underline things. And uh, I just love, and that's where I get a lot of the quotes that I used to put in my writings is I'd get them from the books that I was reading, and I would put those in my various writings. Sure, but I yeah, do the that same book... thing, and you can do that in the PDF too, Daryl. Right. You can, you can highlight in different colors things that you have just read in the book. You can take notes on it, and that helped me a lot, or helps me a lot when I do readings online. It still does. It did in the past, and it still does now, and it will do in the future, because some books I read as when I have them available as a PDF, and I can work on them and uh, highlight uh, things in the text, and I can uh, uh, I can take notes and and and, um, and and put links in there. And all of a sudden, during the reading, open an internet uh, internet connection to a video or another text that is available available somewhere else. This is, of course, how we uh, let's say researchers do this. But this is how everybody should do this because everybody should do his own research. I mean, you don't get anywhere when you just believe what Daryl says or when you just believe what I say or when you believe what Tom Fress says or Brett Norman or who else. It doesn't matter. You only get somewhere when you understand what God says. So you have, exactly. to, measure, you have to measure everything that you study in this world against the Bible. And you know, these, books, these books that are written, and, and I know that Daryl is 100% with me, uh, these books that are written are only interesting when they reflect the true history. And that true history can always be measured on the Bible, because in the Bible we have prophecies. And the biblical prophecy is nothing else but history written in advance. So when we have today the advantage of being in 2018, and we can look back at centuries and centuries of past, we just have to open the right books and see the fulfilling of all biblical prophecies in the past. And that is why Daryl so much advocates reading these books because all the books that he advocates are books that resemble the true history, not the history that is taught in your classroom, not the history that is told in your uh, lecture room in the university, not the history that is told to you on the History Channel or on any other mainstream television outlet anywhere. This is real history. This is most of the time even suppressed history. I mean, can you tell me a reason why that book behind the dictators of Her- Leo Herbert Lehman a few years ago wasn't even available to buy on the internet, and you could only find a free uh, a free PDF for that? Because that book is a time bomb, if you know how to understand that book. And I read that book in English and now in German on my channel, because I have a German brother in Christ who translated the 75 pages of the first 12 chapters of that book into German. And we did 37 recordings of that. That's about 38 or 39 hours of understanding and reading the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehman that was published in 1942. Yeah, Yeah, I've got the book. It's a good book. Yeah, I thought you have it, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> I've probably got uh, maybe three, four hundred books that are related to, like, the Lincoln assassination, the JFK assassination, the starting of World War One, World War Two, and and as I've gone, and I've got many books that have been uh, digitally scanned and reproduced uh, that I buy through my Barnes & Noble from the 1800s. That's where I got my books, like by Samuel 
F.B. Morse, who just happened to invent the American Telegraph. Um, and there's just a lot of writers, uh, European writers that have written book, whether British, uh, French, German, uh, Italian. I've got lots and lots of my books on the Jesuits were written like in the 1800s by many European writers. So we've got a lot of folks out there that have been trying to tell the truth about the Jesuits and you can pick up those books and you, the, cause they're optically, I think it's optically scanned and then uh, they're print-on-demand type books, and I've picked up quite a few books uh, through my local Barnes & Noble by by just going down. They have, I think, about three major groups, Nabu Press, uh, General Books, and Kessinger, that uh, that redo these, again, optically scan these old books. And uh, there's sometimes a, a little mistake happens w- during the scanning, but you're generally able to read 99.9% of the book correctly from the printout that they will do on the print-on-demand of that book. So take advantage of those kind of books because a lot of the books that were written back in the, I'd say even early 1800s up to the early 1900s, a lot of these books will tell you things that you generally don't find in a lot of the newer books that have been put out on the subject. And a lot of you're right, a lot of that stuff has disappeared because while I have a Bachelor of Arts uh, BA in Russian, I kind of like minored in history, and I took university-level history courses, American history, like on American Civil War and American other American history. From like I, because I was in the military and traveled around a lot, I took them from like about three or four different universities, including uh, the University of Maryland that was uh, over in Berlin, Germany, when I was there. So I, I took these courses, and do you think those courses? Any of those history courses on American history at university level in the United States, not one of them told me anything about the eight conspirators being tried by that 12-man military commission involved in the, the Lincoln assassination. And, and that's just come out kind of recently. They, so much information is getting out now that finally guys like Bill O'Reilly has to write a book on killing Lincoln. But does he make any of the Jesuit Knights of the Golden Circle. He may mention Knights of the Golden Circle, but he doesn't make the Jesuit connections, and he doesn't make the uh, papal, uh, the priests. It wasn't just a couple Jesuit priests. There were other Roman Catholic priests that were involved in the conspiracy, and we know there were two French priests at least involved because they hid uh, John Harrison Surratt out around in the area of Montreal, Canada, and then gave him a disguise and got him over to as we mentioned before, to Liverpool, England, and from there he went down and be, joins the Pope's uh, Ninth Zouave Company and becomes part of the bodyguard for the Pope of Rome. So the the man, the object of the greatest manhunt up to that time in American history, John Harrison Surratt, arch conspirator, who, by the way, one of his uh, father confessors, I believe, was B. F. Wiget, who was a Jesuit priest. Uh, he was the father confessor also to Mary E. Surratt, the mommy of uh, John Harrison Surratt, who I believe uh, somebody said that uh, that's where the plot to assassinate Lincoln was hatched in her boarding house, Mary E. Surratt. But uh, visitors included John Wilkes Booth, and almost all these uh, conspirators were uh, members of the what they call it was a Jesuit front group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. The same guys that went down and helped foment the Civil War were heavily involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. By the way, the first woman, to the best of my knowledge, that was executed by the U.S. government was Mary E. Surratt. She was executed. She was one of the four people, the four, one of the four conspirators that were hung by the neck until dead. And there are pictures of that in the the book uh, Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by show the picture Thomas, right here, Darryl. Yeah, Thomas M. Harris. And then the, uh, there's also pick, there's a lot of pictures in the, those two books that were published as two books in one volume by Ozark Book Publishers. But the suppressed truth about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by that wonderful lady, Burke McCarty, again, who spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours going through newspapers and that finally got her book published in 1924. But th- there are two books right there about the Lincoln assassination that gives 
overwhelming proof of Jesuit-controlled papal Rome's involvement in the assassination of a godly American president. He wasn't perfect, but uh, I've got a lot of books on Abraham Lincoln, and uh, including some that Chick Publications put out, like The Big Betrayal. They put out a 64-page booklet, if you would like to read it in comic book style, but it's not nothing funny about it. It's just done in color, and it's in a comic book style booklet, 64 pages. It's called The Big Betrayal, I believe, and you can find that on their web- website, chick.com. And if you want to read about uh, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, that's a good, that's a real good little booklet that you can get through in, in a couple hours reading, and it's very, very informative. Again, I believe it's called The Big Betrayal. I'm looking around here. I've got my house is beginning to look like it did before I had the stroke, <laughs> and that is mountains, mountains, literally, like, you know, Rome sits on seven hills, mountains. Yeah. Oh, I've got about seven mountains of books stacked up <laughs> all surrounding me here where I'm sitting. But, um, yeah, the Chick Publications covers it. Uh, carries a lot of good, a lot of good books, and a lot of good what we would call comic style booklets. And uh, that 64 pager in color on the Big Betrayal is tremendous. Again, you can find that. I see my little, my problem, folks. Is, folks, is I was pretty much totally paralyzed on the right side, so I'm kind of groaning as I'm reaching down here, and I got my chick publications and I just look through they have a lot of great materials on Roman Catholicism they have good materials on the Jesuits including the book and then of course on Charles Chinicky you mentioned that his book now it's a pretty it's a pretty thick book uh, called 50 years in the Church of Rome but it's a tremendous book if you want to really get into uh, the history of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln Charles Chinicky who became personal friends with with Abraham Lincoln Charles Chinicky was a Roman Catholic priest, I believe, for 25 years. And, of course, he was Canadian-born. Um, he got American citizenship later, so we can call him a um, uh, Canadian-American or American-Canadian, however you want to do it. But uh, the man was a very, very godly man. I think one of the most godly men that ever... Here, I'm looking right at the book now, and it's in Chick's latest catalog, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinicky. Here's just real quickly what they say about it. Uh, This classic work shows how this priest began to question Catholic teachings until he became saved and led his entire parish to salvation. That's kind of interesting. His church uh, had gotten fed up with him. They wanted to excommunicate him. They were getting ready to. And he says, my dear, he had a large parish of dear Roman Catholic people, and they loved Charles Chinicky. They chose to, the entire church, left, local church, parish, left the Roman Catholic Church rather than lose their beloved priest, Charles Chinicky, who told the truth. He was also a great crusader against alcoholism, which the, a lot of local priests were abusing. But uh, Charles Chinicky, um, he got accused of rape, basically, uh, sexual assault, uh, by a, a Roman Catholic priest named LaBelle. They they wanted to get rid of Chinicky, even to the point where the priest puts his sister, I believe it was, up to making false testimony. And uh, a, a fairly young lawyer, Abraham Lincoln, uh, where did this disappear? This has disappeared from America's history. A, a lawyer named Abraham Lincoln defends Charles Chinicky, and the Jesuits have come up, and they're sitting in the uh, peanut gallery at the the jury and that near the jury and they're watching the trial and they thought it was a slam dunk as we say in America. They thought it was a slam dunk case. They were going to put this this priest that was causing them problems, Charles Chinicky. They were going to put him away forever in prison. And Abraham Lincoln won that case. And uh, uh, Charles Chinicky uh, was uh, standing there and he started weeping and. And Lincoln runs up and says, "Mr. Chinicky, why are you crying? I, I won the case. You're, you're, you're." You know, of course, the priest took off running because they had someone come that was going to testify about all of the phony baloney stuff that they they had made up and lies and that. But Chinicky goes, "Mr. President, 
I don't know. He didn't say Mr. President. He goes, Mr. Lincoln, because Lincoln wasn't president yet. But he says, Mr. Lincoln, I'm crying because did you see the looks of those Jesuits when they when you got the acquittal? I'm not crying for myself. I'm, you know, I'm glad you won the case. But my goodness, these guys hate you and the Jesuits never forgive and forget. And Mr. And Mr. Lincoln, they'll they'll probably want to try to kill you in in the worst way. And of course, Lincoln knew, remembered that, and he and Chinicky met even after Lincoln uh, became president. And again, there he he saved uh, uh, Chinicky's bacon, as we say in America, um, from going to jail on trumped up charges by this Roman Catholic priest named LaBelle. And that that's quite a story in itself. But that story is told in that fifty years in the Church of Rome. Uh, that I- same man. Go ahead, yeah. I, yeah, I, I want to tell you a little story about 50 years in the Church of Rome. I know that is a tremendous book, and it has more than 400 pages, and it is very, yep. very interesting. And I started reading it in English, and then a German brother suggested to me that he could le- give me that book in German, because there is a PDF version of 50 years in the Church of Rome out in German. And I thought, well, that would be interesting to read that to my betrayed German brethren. Because, you know, when you in the, over there in the United States of America think that you are betrayed, you have no idea how betrayed we over here in Europe are. Okay? So, I said, yeah, okay, send that book to me. And he sent it to me, and I started reading it. And I came to the knowledge after finishing chapter one or something, the publisher wrote in that book, now we have scrapped a few chapters from this book because we don't want to look like Roman Catholic bigots. So a lot of the time when Charles Chinicky was speaking about his education that he got, those chapters were scrapped from the book. So I only read it once. I read this very first one until I came to that part and I said, I'm sorry, my dear German brethren, I am not committing myself to read a censored book which is abridged, with a, which, which is abridged in the truth. I just cannot do it. So when you yeah, want to read that... this book, you have to go mm-hmm. into the English version and read it because, you know, a lot of my German brethren who I have really... Um, um, regular contact with D- just don't speak English or, or not in a way that they could ever understand this book but there's another book out from Charles Chinnikwe that is as interesting as this one and that one is called The Woman, the Priest and the Confessional right? You are, yes and I have that book and of course Chick, book. Chick uh, carries that book and, yeah and I know I have, it, I have the picture right here in the video now Daryl Good. So I thought. And I fa- okay, so mm-hmm. I thought I'm going to read that. And an hour of the truth, some time ago, the broadcast that we are on right now, some two years or so ago, I already did. Uh, I, I read chapter four of that book. That's about this woman that falls in love with her young priest, and then she faints her death and um, goes away with him and uh, lives as, uh, lives as a house for the for the rest of her life. And anyway, read it. it's chapter four of the book. The priest, the woman, and the confessional. And again, I got, that, I got that suggestion to get that book in German. And again, there are, not, there are some 20 plus pages missing. That chapter that I was reading in English is missing in that book. You know... It sounds like is, you have a little bit of censorship over there, Yerk. Yeah, right. Don't we? <laughs> At least... At least the American version of Charles Jenicki's book in English language, uh, at least all of the stuff is still there with the you Chick should, Publications book. You should book. know, Daryl, how much information on the Jesuits and all is available in the English language all over the world, which we in Germany or here in Europe just don't get, and especially in a country in Germany, you know? Germany is held dumb. Germany is being suppressed since the end of World War II. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm i just reading this book from... Um, 
Leo Herbert Lehman, Behind the Dictators. And in that book from Leo Herbert Lehman, there is a quote. And that quote comes from the German Kaiser, Frederick II, who was Kaiser until the end of World War I. And he spoke about an audience that he had with the Antichrist, Pope Leo III, somewhere in uh, the 13th, sorry, uh, Leo XIII, somewhere in the 1880s. He was the successor of Pope Pio IX, uh, Pius IX. And he had a private audience with the, with the Pope, and he said in his memoirs, the Kaiser wrote in his memoirs, that the Pope addressed him and said to him that the Pope wishes that Germany w would become the uh, sword of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Kaiser responded and said, I am sorry, Pope, but we don't live in the time of the Holy Roman Empire anymore. Times have changed. But still, the Pope insisted on his request. Now, for the end of this broadcast, because we're almost at an hour, now we're going a little bit biblically. And I guess Daryl will love that very much. Sure. Um What's the point that I want to make? Let me just gather my thoughts here. Because While you're doing that, Yerk, let me tell them real quickly. I found that in the catalog that I have in my hands. It's called the 64-page full-color comic. The Big Betrayal is the name of the comic. 64 pages in color. The Big Betrayal. And here's what it says. Here in comic book format is the moving testimony of Charles Chinicky, a former Catholic priest who was converted to Christ. Also shows how the Jesuits were behind the murder of his friend, Abraham Lincoln. And let me just give him the quick the phone number for Chick, and I'll just give it once because you can always go back. 909-987-0771. Don't forget they're on Pacific Time when you call. They're out on the West Coast of the United States. But Chick Publications carries a lot of good materials. I'd recommend you just go up on their website and take a look. They've got covered on a lot of subjects, a lot of subjects including Freemasonry. I think they might have something on Mormonism, but they certainly have uh, a lot on Roman Catholicism, and they have uh, some good books on Islam also. So, Yerk, I hope you gathered your thoughts and you found what you're looking for in the Bible because we've mentioned this many times and we want to uh, always exalt the Bible. There's nothing more important in this world than God's Word. And uh, if you're not into reading for any reasons, bad eyesight or anything, get a, uh, a compact disc of uh, somebody reading the, if you can, if you're an English speaker, get the King James Bible. Uh, Gregory Peck used to read it on audio cassettes, but uh, the one I've got is Alexander Scorby, which who I believe is British, isn't he? York? I think Alexander Scorby is is a Brit, oh, that's and uh, I don't know. And he does it. He does an outstanding job of reading the King James Bible, and I listen to it quite frequently when I'm riding my exercise bike, which I need to do more, or when I'm walking in my house. But again, uh, I want to make sure that before York starts with his Bible verses, and that's so important, is that folks know that uh, listen to the Bible when you get a chance, riding okay. in your, your vehicle. Not... I'm not actually reading from the Bible, Daryl, but I'm going to make a Bible connection because of that okay. quote. That because of that quote that Kaiser wrote in his memoirs that he had in an audience with uh, Antichrist Pope Leo the Thirteenth. So Leo the Thirteenth told the taught, uh, told the Kaiser that he wishes that Germany becomes the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. A few years later, World War One breaks out, and who is the culprit? Germany. Who gets the blame? Germany. And who starts the war? Quote unquote, who starts the war? Because when you know the real doings, you know that Germany didn't start the war, but Germany did. So Germany fulfilled its role in World War I. Germany didn't even lose the war. In the, in the end of World War I, not one Allied soldier ever stood any foot on German soil. You have to know that and understand that. Anyway, it came to the negotiations in France, in Versailles, that uh, castle that is outside of Paris, where the Germans um, 
humiliated the French in 1871 after the war they fought against them mm -hmm. and Bismarck founded the First uh, or the Second Reich. They went then to Versailles and let the French sign their, uh, how do you say that, uh, their the note of defeat. Yeah? So th they were defeated and they had to sign a peace treaty at the time and that was made in Versailles. So then after the World War I, Germany was invited to come to Versailles and sign its <laughs> fate with this uh, treaty they signed there. And Germany had to do payments uh, until even 2011, I think the last payment was done for reparations on World War I. And then you have someone, I'm just looking the picture up here, who is called uh, General, uh, uh, General Marshal Foch. Have you ever heard of him, Foch or Foch? Yes. Marshal Foch. He was the allied. Uh, he was the supreme head of the allied forces in the First World War. Just a picture here in the video that you can see him. And he made a statement, and I think that is in Edmond Paris's book, um, The Secret History of the Jesuits. And he said, "What we are signing here in Versailles in 1919 is not a peace treaty." But a 20-year truce. That was 1919. What happened 20 years later, 1939? This Austrian low soldier Adolf Hitler broke loose of World War II. Again, Germany became the sword of the Roman Catholic Church and started an inquisitional crusade all over the world, especially in Europe, in 1939. Again, Germany became the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. Germany did what the Pope ordered it to do. But now, there is the relation to the Bible. In Revelations chapter 13, we read of two beasts. We read in the beginning... And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. And the dragon gave him his seed, and the dragon gave him his authority. Great authority. And we know from Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon is that old serpent called the devil. Okay? This is the first beast we are speaking about. And everybody who studies his Bible and who studies history understands that this first beast cannot be misidentified but by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Vatican. The Vatican is the beast and the Roman Catholic Church is the woman that rides the beast. No question about that. When we go on to verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. I'm not going any further to this. Anybody who studies his Bible, studies history, and studies the subject understands without any mistake that this second beast talking about in the Bible is the mentioning of the United States of America. So we are speaking of another beast that does the working of the first beast. Now, what is the importance with the link that I told you about what the German Kaiser wrote in his memoirs? The Pope told the German Kaiser that Germany should be the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. And Germany was the sword of the Roman Catholic Church in World War I. And Germany was the sword of the Roman Catholic Church in World War II. But from the end of World War II onwards, another beast took over. And that is the moment when the United States of America began to speak as a dragon. And not as a lamb anymore. Because from that time on, the United States of America were fomenting all the wars that we have here in the world. And they were especially starting the war in a different way because they were not fighting wars against soldiers. The Americans are fighting wars against the civil population. That's what 
made the change in all the wars after World War II. We fight against the civil population of a country. We don't fight wars in a kind of a front anymore, where the one soldier stands against the other, and they are shooting each other, which is wrong anyway. Don't get me started about war. I mean, that's biblically totally wrong. That's not the point. But the point is that they even changed the understanding of what war is. Today, war is fought against the civil population of any country. And that's what the Americans did. Not only the Americans, other nations do that too, don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing Americans, but the point is, at the end of World War II, the sword was taken away from the Germans and given to the Americans, and the Americans took over that role that the Pope ordered Germany to be in World War I and World War II. Do you know what that conclusion, uh, what, uh, to what conclusion that leads me? The Pope wanted to be smarter as God. He wanted to make Germany what biblically already was foretold America must be. Because it speaks of the second beast, uh, behold, another beast coming up out of the earth. Germany could not come out of the earth. Germany was part of the nations, tongues and multitudes in Europe where the first beast came out of. But it was America. And the Pope thought he could make his policy stand above the Bible. And why did he do that? To give the people the idea that the Bible is not right. Because everybody identified the culprit in those years with Germany. Oh, but then Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 and on, could not be the United States of America. What's he talking about? But now we have the understanding that it was. And God always gets his will done. Ultimately, God is always in control. We should never forget that. We should always remember that. And therefore, we should always read his book. Read our Bible. And Daryl, this is normally the sentence where I end the broadcast with, and it's been more than an hour, but I want to give you, of course, some closing remarks before I close it down here. So please, so you can answer to what I just said and share with us what your thoughts are on my explanation that I just gave you. Please. Well, first off, I'll say this again, that it's been an honor and privilege to to be on with Yerk and to talk about these subjects, and again, to that we exalt God's Word. And uh, God's Word in the book of Revelation very, very clearly lays out, um, especially chapters 13 through the early part of chapter 18, it describes who the Antichrist and the Whore harlot religious system is. Um, I just want to say quickly also, uh, just to give a little quote here, they set up these wars, and of course, uh, Jesuit controlled papal Rome set up both World War I and World War II, and we mentioned that wonderful quote there by uh, Edmund Paris in his book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. But uh, Brett sent me a very interesting uh, book, I think in PDF format or whatever, but it, it came over via an email to me. And it was called, it's a book, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing the author's name correctly, J.A. Kensit, K E N S I T, but it's called Rome Behind the Great War by the Protestant Truth Society in London in 1919. And on page three, it is a very short quote, and it, it, it dovetails perfectly with what yerk has been saying is about how they, with the Versailles Treaty, uh, they after World War I, they, they definitely set up World War II with that. But here is a very interesting, very short quote um, by Mr. Kensett. He says that the dark, sinister hand of the papacy was behind the central powers, and he's talking about Germany, Austria, Hungary, Turkey and Bulgaria in the Great War, or in other words, World War I, is now accepted by all unprejudiced minds. And it is the very, very clearly brought out by both Edmund Paris, J.A. Kensett, and others that um, the popes, rather than trying to uh, prevent World War I and World War II, as we are told by a number of people within the Roman Catholic hierarchy, no, they were, they were much, it could be much better said that they helped to foment both of those wars rather than try to prevent them. And a Roman Catholic author, final thing I'm going to say, Roman Catholic author named, uh, award-winning author and uh, journalist, uh, John Cornwell, 
uh, or yeah, I think it's Cornwell or Cornwall, wrote a book called uh, Hitler's Pope. That's a tremendous book that shows the tremendous, tremendous hatred that this uh, Pope Pius, who became Pope Pius XII when he was a Cardinal Secretary of State, Eugenio Pacelli, that he had such a great hatred for the Jews uh, that hasn't changed at all. So anyway, thank you so much, Yerk, for having me on, and I thought it'd be important to get that little quote from J.A. Kensett in there. Yes, uh, thank you, Daryl. Thank you very much for visiting me on Hour of the Truth, and I hope that we will, in the, in the short future, continue and do other readings like this. Just a little explanation where uh, Brett got to know John Kensett from, the one that he sent the book from. That uh, that person was mentioned when I did the book reading of the book of Michael de Semlian, All Roads Lead to Rome. Also, That's right. Also a book that I read in English and in German, both languages on my YouTube channel. You can uh, look up the playlist and then you can watch uh, the videos. And um, in that book, uh, Michael de Semlian, who is a co-worker with, uh, I like to call it like that, uh, with Richard Bennett, who Daryl also very much appreciates, like me. Yes. Michael de Semlian wrote that book, um, All Roads Lead to Rome, and after that he wrote a part two that is called uh, The Foundations Under Attack, and that yes. book was read by Tom Fress in 2017, I think, uh, on First Amendment Radio, an Inquisition update, so when you go to um, First Amendment Radio's YouTube channel and you browse through the playlist you will see the playlist of uh, Tom Fress reading The Foundations Under Attack and when you go to my YouTube channel you will see the videos that I mentioned here during the broadcast um, Daryl, I thank you very much and uh, for joining me today in this broadcast on Hour of the Truth I hope that uh, the viewers and listeners of this video enjoyed the revelation we tried to give them today about the hand of God, as well as in the Lincoln assassination, as in 9-11. By way of saying that even something bad has something good in it. God used these events to show his almighty power to the people who are not too blind to see. And who are the people who are not too blind to see? The people who revere the 1611 authorized version King James Bible, the only true preserved word of God in our day that we live in today, 2018. Get that Bible. Read that Bible. Study that Bible. Live that Bible. Live with Jesus Christ. Say goodbye to this Antichrist deadly system and receive the holy gift, uh, the gift of our Lord of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Therefore, get to know your God. Read your Bible. Maranatha.